Hey guys, it's your host Julian. This week I'm sitting down with background artist for King of the Hill, Chuck Maiden. We talk how Chuck got on the King of the Hill, and then we close out the conversation with American Dad. I want to give a special shout out to a couple of our patrons that help make this podcast possible. Bill, Brent, Patrick, and Jacob. Thank you all so much for your support. It truly means a lot. If you want to become a patron and help support this show, check out the show notes below and sign up today. Now, let's get on to my chat with Chuck. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to What's My Podcast. I'm Julian. Today, I'm joined by Chuck. Chuck, man, long time coming. Welcome to the show. Hey, Julian. Great to be here. Oh, man, it's great to have you here. Ladies and gentlemen, we are continuing our King of the Hill deep dive for this episode right here with Chuck. Now, your name was jo- dropped, excuse me, by Chuck Austin. And once Chuck mm-hmm. had this beautiful things to say about you, like, what the fuck, man, I love backgrounds. I got to figure out what's going <laughs> on with Chuck and what Chuck was doing. So I would love to know, man, how did you come from watching the show to working on the show oh wow so yeah well i definitely remember the first time i saw the show it was when it started airing in january of 97. um it came on i don't know if i i looked for it it was just kind of on and i knew it was a mike judge show and i had the same reaction i had to the first time i saw beavis and butthead which was just instant laughter yeah i saw the opening of beavis and butthead with them chuckling i just instantly started laughing i couldn't help it <laughs> And so King of the Hill was exactly the same thing. It was the episode in the first season. I can't remember the name of the episode, but where um, Luann was crying with mascara running down her cheeks. Mm-hmm. And Hank was like, I'm trying to fix her like a carburetor. <laughs> um, I was just, I was like, oh my God, this is just so funny. And I just love uh, Mike Judge's, the way his mind works and his humor. So that was the first time I saw it. And little did I know that about three months later i would actually be working on the show I, I still look back on that and just like blown away like how did that happen you know so and um i got lucky you know <laughs> so, so uh, what was that spark for you went from watching to three months later you're working on the show what what happened in those three well, months it was my first job in animation and i was 43 years old at the time i just turned 70 so i was a I was still a young man, but I was, you know what I mean? It was kind of late to be starting a career, but um, I've always been interested in animation since I was a kid and um, wanted to work in cartoons when I was like as young as four or five years old Mm -hmm. Um, and got sidetracked and got into music in my teens and stuff. And so I pursued a career in music as a singer songwriter and uh, very seriously and just very competitive and tough, but I had a lot of fun, but never, nothing ever happened. But so in my 30s, I told I always told myself in my 30s, by the time I get to like 35, which is almost what your age almost is, <laughs> yeah. um, I will uh, try something else. You know, I'll mm-hmm. try art because I remember being interested in art. So I did. And I what I ended up doing was uh, going back to, uh, I went to uh, graphic design school because I was like, what can I do to make a living in art? I didn't really think that I could, you know, I didn't know what what the options were really. So I thought, well, maybe I could at least design logos or letterheads, or yeah. you know. So I went to graphic design school, and uh, just to like a technical college. Didn't wanted to do it fast, you know. Did it in like nine months, and uh, learned Photoshop there. And this is when this is the early '90s when computers were just starting to happen. And uh, I love Photoshop, as well as the other apps like Illustrator and stuff. And uh, ended up working for a short time as a graphic designer, uh, designing. Uh, a Sunday insert for the LA Times for a uh, electronic superstore called uh, LA Tronics. And uh, it just paid shit. You know, I made like, I don't know, seven bucks an hour or something like that. Jesus. And it was part time, you know, it was like 20 hours a week or something. I was like, well, this isn't very good, but at least I am working as a graphic designer. And then uh, my sister had followed, my older sister followed my footsteps. She was a good artist too. And so she went to the same graphic design school. And then I was kind of trying to help her find a job. So I was looking in the paper one day at the one ads. And I go, hey, um, hey, Becky, here's a, uh, an ad for Photoshop artists. I said, I have no idea what it is, but you know, check it out, you know? So she went and did check it out. And it turned out it was Malibu Comics. 
in Calabasas, which was near where I lived. And, um, and they were looking for comic book colorists. And so she went down there and she got the job or, or she told me about it. And she, she said, they're giving tests, you know? And I was like, Oh God, I don't even know how to do that. You know? And, and she go, I go, well, how many colors do they need? She goes, they need like seven. So I go, well, maybe I'll go try too. So we, we both long story short, we both ended up getting jobs at Malibu comics, uh, uh coloring comic books. Uh, for the Ultraverse, and then we ended up later when Marvel bought us doing Marvel Comics coloring. Um, and that just turned into a big game changer for me. It, it didn't mm -hmm. pay very good at first, but it got a little bit better, better later. Um, and I worked there from 94 to the beginning of 97, around the time I saw that first King of the Hill episode. And a bunch of people, what happened was uh, Marvel bought us for a while, and they ended up... Um, hiring a company in Ireland to do their coloring for cheaper. And so that just busted up Malibu Comics because we were like the last department left there. And yeah. um, so um, so a bunch of people are getting jobs in animation. And I was like, wow, could that be a possibility? Could I work in animation, you know? So I took some a couple classes, you know, in background design and life drawing and and background painting and uh, I thought maybe I could be a background painter because that was always kind of my dream. I always loved the backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, I cobbled together somewhat of a portfolio and started shopping it around, dropping copies of the my portfolio off, you know, color copies in a binder off to the different studios, not really getting anything. And I went to uh, Film Roman where I knew they did The Simpsons and I, I knew that they started doing King of the Hill there, which I loved, you know, and um, didn't hear back from him, you know, and and Jay Francis was this really cool guy who worked at Film Roman. He was the recruiter there. And um, I called back, you know, I was I was pretty proactive. You know, I called back a couple of weeks later. I was still thinking this isn't really going to happen, but what else can I do? I'm unemployed. I got to try something. So uh, I called back a couple of weeks later and Talked to receptionist. I said, could I talk to Jay Francis? I said, I'm just curious if you guys, if he had a chance to look at my portfolio. So um, <clears throat> got put on hold for a minute. And then Jay came on. He said, hey, Chuck, this is Jay. He goes, I'm so sorry. We can't find your portfolio. <laughs> and I go, oh, bummer. I go, well, that's okay. I'll bring another, you know. He goes, okay, cool. You know, so I brought one, dropped it off and um, <clears throat> got home, checked my messages this is before cell phones. Uh, check my <laughs> messages on my answering machine. Like, hey, th this is Jay Francis. Hey, Chuck, um, we wanted to see if you're interested in the, um, taking a test for The Simpsons or uh, King of the Hill. And I was like, holy shit, you know what? <laughs> so I literally, right after I got home, drove all the way back there and saw him. And he, he said he had a test in, in each hand. And he goes, do you want to take a test for backgrounds? He goes, we're not looking for background painters because that's what I was looking for. And I, I didn't even know background layout was a thing. I didn't know anything about animation, really. And he goes, you want to take a test for The Simpsons or you want to take a test for King of the Hill? And, you know, those opportunities just don't come along every day. So I said, well, I just love King of the Hill. So let me do King of the Hill. And even though I love The Simpsons too, King of the Hill, like really, you know, I got off on that show. And so I went home and just busted my ass over the test, went and got a light box. I, I, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't even know <laughs> that I could use a pencil and eraser to do the test. I thought I had to be finished with a nice pen, and which made it way harder. Yeah. So <laughs> I got through the, and I, I actually called my friend at the end of it. I said, this isn't gonna happen. I, I'm not good at this, you know, I don't think I can do this. He goes, you gotta turn this test in, just finish it and turn it in. Otherwise you'll never know. So I, I was about to throw it in the trash, but I uh, finished the test, turned it in with a little white out to fix my mistakes and stuff, and uh, turned it in, and uh, then didn't hear back for a few weeks, you know. In the meantime, I, had, I, I applied for a job at a video game company as an art director, which had, another thing I felt totally unqualified for, um, but, you know, I was just trying. And uh, then my wife and I at the time, my wife at the time and I just said, let's just drive to Seattle because I used to live in Seattle for a while. 
let's just drive up there and just get the hell out of here. I'm tired of looking for a job, you know? And so I started driving. Well, on the way, I stopped to check my messages at a phone booth. <laughs> and <laughs> um, they wanted to hire me as an art director at this video game company. I said, like, what? And the guy he said, yeah, you know, I said, well, I'm on my way to Seattle. I'll be back in a week. He goes, okay, just come and see us, you know? I said, well, that's cool. And then I get to Seattle and I'm visiting my sister and brother-in-law and uh, we're staying at their apartment and uh, all of a sudden Pat, my brother-in-law goes, hey Chuck, phone's for you. I go, what? And um, He goes, yeah, phone's for you. Because I had left an outgoing message on my phone where I was going to be and everything. And uh, it's uh, Mike Wolf. He goes, mm. hey Chuck, this is Mike Wolf at Film Roman. Uh, we really liked your test. We want to know if you'd like to work on King of the Hill as a background layout artist. And I just, it's just one of those once in a lifetime moments where your spirit just soars through your, up into the skies, you know? Did it feel and real? I was like, definitely. Um, it felt real and unreal at the same time. And I, I still kind of get chills when I think about it. Mm -hmm. um, but it was like, wow. Finally, something really went right in my life, you know, <laughs> after, you know, struggling for so many years, trying to figure out what I wanted to do and everything. So, uh, yeah, so um, told me the start date was April 26, 1997. I still remember the date. And, th and then the fear set in like, oh, my God, I'm going to they're not going to, you know, they're they're going to see that I don't know what I'm doing. You know? Yeah. <laughs> well. Let's just go in there and see what happens. So I, I went I went there and sat in the lobby, the little tiny film room was kind of a crappy building. I don't know, you've probably heard before, but you know, it stains on the carpets and yeah. <laughs> you know, elevators that didn't work good and stuff. And so I'm sitting in there and there, I go, wow, this is where they do the Simpsons and the King of the Hill. You know, it just didn't seem very glamorous or anything. But um, so I sat down next to James McDermott who uh, went on to become a character designer on the show and also Bob's Burgers and Rick and Morty. And uh, he's done very well. And he was 19 at the time. Jeez. First animation gig. And uh, we ended up having cubicles next to each other for that first. It was actually the second season we were working on. But uh, so um, showed me to my cubicle and then I proceeded to sit around for two weeks with nothing to do until because they weren't ready for me. The storyboard was was a fiasco. It was Martin Archer's, uh, he was the director, and Wes Archer's brother. Mm -hmm. And uh, things were just unorganized. He was he was struggling. One of his storyboard artists wasn't that good. And um, so I ended up designing a lot of the backgrounds myself as I drew them. And it was just like trial by fire. Um, but God, it was fun. It was so fun. I would just, I just pinch myself every day. And I, I wasn't I think I was just good enough to get the job I was lucky that they were looking for a lot of artists at the time yeah you know so animation was kind of short-staffed in those days and uh, I was just very lucky and just the timing was right but uh, I got pretty good over time you know I still wanted to be a, a background painter um, which I ended up getting to do you know in the uh, third season so yeah so that was my start at film at uh, King of the Hill What's really cool, and uh, I wrote some, I wrote a couple things down that I wanted to circle back to. Um, the first one is, is kind of I, I try to stay away from these type of questions because it is hard to remember for so long. But I, I think with something as seminal as The Simpsons and something as seminal as The King of the Hill, it might be pretty vivid. Um, but with you being a a civilian outside of animation at that point, when you're watching mm -hmm. King of the Hill and and you're watching uh, uh, The Simpsons. What was it like talking with your adult friends? Was The Simpsons, I, The Simpsons is a phenomenon, right? But what yeah. was it like back then? This is like eight years after, you know, The Simpsons is really starting to hit their yeah. stride. Mm -hmm. But what was it like? Like, was that a, a, always a topic of discussion with The Simpsons and adult animation? Um, you know, it was, just, it, was just, it was just part of pop culture at the time. Mm -hmm. um, um, I... I talked to a lot. I, when people ask what I did, I very proudly said I work on King of the Hill, you know? Yeah. Um, and a lot of people didn't know the show, you know? And I get this a lot. Oh, 
I've never heard of that, but I love the Simpsons. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know anybody who works on the Simpsons? I go, well, they're downstairs. Yeah. Uh, and it, it funny, funny enough, it, it, when I started working on American Dad, it was kind of the same. I don't know if this is answering your question, but when I started working on American Dad, it was the same thing. I, I've never seen American Dad, but I love Family Guy. Love family I Guy. Yeah. It was, so it was always like the ugly stepsister uh, show, you know, yeah. but still very proud. But um, I'm not sure if I, I, I understand the gist of your question your question oh no what what i was getting at because uh they have been you know whenever you hear animation like you always hear adult like we want more adult animation we want more stuff that Mm -hmm. are geared toward adults you got rick and morty you got bob's burgers you know so there's been an explosion of adult themed animation over the last couple years but i'm curious is was that same sentiment back then when the simpsons were hot and heavy was it just Hey there, I'm Isaiah, and welcome to my channel, 47 Cartoon Guy, a channel dedicated to all things animation and nostalgia. I do retrospectives, short comedic videos, and remember videos, if I can get away with it, that is. I have many videos dedicated to some of my favorite animation properties, such as nostalgic lookbacks on Cartoon Network's Golden Age, and also videos focusing on Scooby-Doo, one of my favorite cartoons of all time. In my most recent series, The Fantastic Legacy of Hanna-Barbera, dives into the history of the legendary animation studio and its founders. If you love my videos, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click the bell icon so you'll know when I have a new video up. And also consider donating to my Patreon, where you can support the channel and get early access to videos, behind the scenes pics, and even view exclusive future remember videos. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you soon. Until next time, I'm 47 Cartoon Guy and I gotta fly. We want nothing but The Simpsons or was there really a push between, you know, we really want adult animation. Did you ever hear that from, you know, just talking about The Simpsons and King of the Hill with your friends? No, I don't think so. I think I think people just look at it as an alternative form of entertainment, you know, mm. and um, it, it definitely filled a need, you yeah. know. And what I, what I immediately thought of at the time, because it was primetime animation, basically, was I was I'm old enough to remember the Flintstones when they came mm. on the air. It was a big deal. That yeah. show was a huge deal. It was a primetime animated sitcom, and um, it was like, whoa, this has never happened before. And so to me, it was it wasn't like that new because I remember the Flintstones and then the Jetsons mm. after that. So. Um, I I don't know. It just you, it's like we just all kind of took it in stride, just like all the great music of the '60s and the '70s and stuff. Yeah. You were there, but it was just like, well, this is just what it is, you know. Yeah, I've all, I've always been fascinated. I'm working on a I'm working on a, a video um, for next month, and uh, the Simpsons are playing a huge part into it. Um, the the other thing I wanted to circle back to um, was. What was so endearing about that that first time you saw King of the Hill? Like, what made it pop out and what made it stand out to you? Um, well, first, the first scene I saw, because I tuned in the middle of the episode, was Luann's mm-hmm. voice, voiced by Brittany Murphy, which was yeah. just genius. One of a kind. And uh, Hank Hill, voiced by Mike Judge. Those two voices and their acting abilities and the writing i i just never seen anything like it I, it was just so damn funny here was this square pick you know hank hill yeah. trying to grapple with the emotions of luann and just failing miserably and so uncomfortable you could just see his discomfort and mm-hmm. that's to me that's what really was the heart of the show that made it so funny was hank's discomfort with modern society yeah just wanting things to be straight and fit in a box you know um so i I guess that was the funniest thing that struck me yeah it it, it is interesting in watching king of the hill seeing him struggle with that the world is changing and you know getting older you can kind of see that now like i'm I'm sitting here I'm, i'm like things aren't the way they used to be so getting to draw that correlation with a character like hank like man i kind of understand what hank was going through um with uh with that pencil test, do you remember what your pencil test was? You know, did you have to do yeah, a walk yeah, cycle? It was, was it background? I definitely remember it. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was a background layout test. Um, and it was three backgrounds we had to draw. And they, it was very organized. Um, probably Wes Archer put it together, I guess, or somebody. Um, 
and it was three backgrounds. One was, and they were from pre-existing, from our, from previous episodes and actual episodes. Uh, one was a an aerial shot looking down on the hill driveway when the guys are gathered around Hank's truck with the hood open. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can see a big tree kind of in the foreground on the right. And then you, and so you had to know perspective. And I remember I, I, I majored in art in high school. And so this is kind of a sidetrack, sorry. Um, no, you're fine. And I, I remember uh, being taught perspective in high school and I loved perspective. I just love that scientific, there was a scientific formula to doing perspective that looked realistic, you know, using mm-hmm. vanishing points and horizon lines. Um, so anyway, um, there was that one and then there was, um, and then that was the easy one. Yeah. And then there was one in the kitchen, it was, um, facing the back of the kitchen, that classic shot with the dining table, you know, sideways in front of you with the chairs around it and, um, getting the proportions of those cupboard doors, right. And I'm a perfectionist, so it was driving me nuts to try to get everything to fit together the way it was. And basically, we were basically trying to duplicate what was uh, given on a rough storyboard pen. So the storyboard mm-hmm. artist had roughed in the background and you were supposed to do a nice version of it. Not a clean, cleaned up version, but something that overseas could trace and you know make perfect lines of. And then the, the third one, by far the hardest, was in the, uh, Bobby's classroom with all these desks at an angle looking at the back of the classroom and everything this is the other thing and they gave just the character level everything had to register to your background exactly like so they had all these students floating in air sitting at desks and you had to draw a desk to correspond to each student perfectly so that they looked Mm -hmm. like they were actually sitting on the desk on the on the chair of the desk with their feet on the floor, you know what I mean? Yeah. And at first I thought, well, this would be easy. You know, this is, I'll just do, you know, um, use perspective and do lines to a vanishing point and all the desks will line up. No, they didn't. Each desk was a little askew. So, and like I say, I, I, I didn't know enough. And it said, you know, it's okay if these are a little rough, but I didn't, like, I'm not going to do them rough. I'm going to do a good job, you know? Yeah. So, um, I asked my friend who had already had a job that I work with in Malibu Comics, uh, Noel Aragon. He was working at um, Deke uh, Animation at the time. And I called him, I said, God, what do I use to draw these backgrounds? I don't even know what kind of pen should I use? And he goes, I guess I just get a black razor point pen, which was at the time, I don't even think they sell them anymore, but it was like a fine point uh, felt pen, black. I'm like, okay, yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, that makes a nice line, you know. So I got one of those and, and so I draw everything in and then on another with the light box with the sheets and the characters and everything you could see through the paper, got animation paper, um, lined everything up and would trace the, the rough lines with my razor point pen. And I mm-hmm. do that kitchen, get almost to the end and go, oh crap, I, you know, I screwed up and I start over again. I did that several times. That's why I was pulling my hair out going, I, I can't yeah. do this. I don't know how anybody can do this. Not knowing I could have just used a pencil and erased it, it would have been fine, <laughs> you know? So um, yeah, that was the test. And uh, it was funny because toward the end of my tenure on King of the Hill, or like 2009, 2008, Phil Hayes, the background uh, supervisor brought me a test. And he goes, he goes, what do you think of this one? I was thinking about hiring this guy. I go, let me see. And it was a copy of my test he was showing me. He was just playing a joke on me. He goes, what do you think of this guy? And I go, I looked at it and it was really kind of weird because he told me later, I was kind of pissed at him. But I go, uh, yeah, it looks, I guess, yeah, this. I think this guy would be okay. But I said, it could be better, but I think it'll be all right. <laughs> and he goes, this is your test, man. <laughs> I was like, damn you. Um, yeah, so that, that was it, but I guess it was good enough to, to get, get me in the door. And, and I have to thank Phil Hayes for, cause he's the one that okayed my test and gave me the green light to get hired. So now, yeah. uh, Sean, you know, Sean Cashman. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, uh, this it's come up a couple different times. Um, I, I think with Paul and, um, 
maybe Glenn. I can't remember uh, everybody that came mm -hmm. that came up with, but but Sean was in charge of teaching like all of the new guys. Yes. Like yes. the story. Did did you guys have something like that or backgrounds yes. like yeah. like a class, a crash course? Well, here's the other cool thing about that job that was still so perfect for me, because I thought you know, like I said, I thought I was going to fail. I wouldn't know what I was doing. They were so patient. Mm -hmm. And then I realized I was better than some people already that were working there. So it's like no, nobody was perfect. Everybody had strengths and weaknesses, but we got the job done. But uh, I learned on the job. I just I asked questions, you know, how, how do I do this, you know? And, and we were doing, like I think Glenn mentioned, that we were doing the reduced storyboard, uh, kind of a mm -hmm. big storyboard. It was basically half full, half full animation. Excuse me. <clears throat> so I um, can't remember when it was, but yes, yeah, they go, we're going to go full layout. You know, they decided to spring more money for the show. And, and so Sean was put in charge of teaching us all full layout, which was such a blessing. I mean, yeah. he taught us how to do pans and to how to mark uh, the fields and everything. And the field, you know, uh, when a camera would move and stuff, camera moves and um, um, banana pans, which is when you, the camera's face into the right and somebody drives by on a road you know and then the camera moves to the left with the car well the, mm -hmm. the background ends up looking like a banana because in perspective it kind of gets smaller on the sides but um yeah he taught us all that stuff and it was so fun and i was like i can't believe i'm getting paid to learn how to do you know um i can't remember the term it's not full-scale animation but um i can't remember what it's called but anyway it was just you know 12 field animation um yeah so sean was great and he was showing us all these because he worked on the simpsons he was showing us um examples that he had done on the simpsons mm -hmm. of his of his uh, layouts and they were we're like whoa this is so great like homer perfectly drawn i mean rough you know but it's just so beautiful and i just love the beauty of the layout and the, and the rough drawings of the backgrounds and the characters so yeah, that was really cool that he taught us that. Yeah, yeah, he's great, he's great such a guy too. He's such a nice guy. Oh, a hundred percent. He he's hands down one of my favorite people I've gotten to talk to because one, he's so patient. Two, he's got so much knowledge up here. He he'll forget more than I'll ever be able to retain. You know what I mean? Um, and like I said, it's just a cool dude. Um, one thing that I've always been interested in: uh, at what point? Do you start because obviously all we have to do is pull out our phones and we can google any photo uh if you want to do bleach i think uh, i think sean was actually talking about he had to do bleachers maybe it was for uh hank's cowboy movie <laughs> there was something yeah. that it's just like he, he couldn't figure it out and they would go and take pictures of yeah. so at what point are you starting to build like a, a reference binder for any any of the backgrounds that oh, you yeah. might uh, be working on yeah yeah so yeah that was that was big i know it's so weird because we use the internet now back then you'd find magazines and books and stuff i definitely bought some books uh, at the bookstore on perspective a lot of books on perspective and and yeah sometimes you would just uh, i think i believe we had cameras and we'd go take pictures sometimes go to the park and take mm -hmm. pictures of bleachers and things like that and then i know in the prop department uh, design department they had a big bookcase just filled with magazines like furniture yeah. magazines and stuff they'd use for reference how to draw uh, phones and tables and things like that yeah so yeah reference was the thing and um um it didn't have to be perfect you know what i mean it, mm -hmm. it, it, it just get it close although i will say that um it's kind of funny because they were all, i remember when i first got presented the test to do a uh, jay was said now this is realistic anime uh, this is realistic perspective you know do you know how to do realistic perspective and i was like oh yeah 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 you know um and they're always saying that this has got to look real it's got to be a real world and i get that but in in my mind in my memory it never really was that yeah <laughs> perfect you know just but it we just got to get in the ballpark you know what i mean it was yeah. perfectly imperfect, if that makes any sense. Yeah. There was a and lot that, of nuances remember, to that skew. Yeah. And I remember Adriana Galvesley, background painting supervisor, when I joined the background painting department, said, um, you know, shadows, you know, you got you to think about a light source and which way is the shadow going to fall of a cactus or whatever it is. 
And she said, doesn't have to be perfect. Don't worry about it. If it's, you know, like if a, a shadow of a tree is a little different than the shadow of a bush or something like that, she goes, you just got to get it close, you know? So, yeah. Well, that's really cool. Um, now with you doing backgrounds, obviously you said you had a, a, a tough time with that pencil test. Um, at what point <laughs> that first, uh, I guess, first year, did you start feeling comfortable? At what point did you start feeling like, okay, I'm, I'm good at this. I can do this. This is second nature. Well, I, I know we're going to talk about Ian Wilcox later, but I, 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 when you said that, my first thought of Ian, mm -hmm. because um, a few months into my first season is when Ian got hired. And uh, the same day that uh, Ginny Sherwood got hired, and God bless both of them because they're both gone now. But um, Ian was just like, you know, as soon as you met him, you're like, I love this guy. You know? Yeah. And so he came over to my cubicle and he goes, oh, you know, I don't know if that's when we met, but he said, oh, can I just watch what you're doing, you know? And he was he was just so open and everything and enthusiastic. And I go, sure, you know? And and I just happened to be kind of working on a kind of a cool layout with trees and whatever, houses. And uh, I was just roughing in the back. He goes, uh, he, I go, this is how I do it. I take a blue pencil and I just rough in the backgrounds like trees. I just do a bunch of different size circles to get the general shape of the tree. And he goes, oh, this is, oh, this is really interesting. He goes, Jenny, Jenny, come here. Look at Chuck. Chuck's showing us how to draw backgrounds. And they both got hired as background layout of people. And so Jenny, Jenny was already an experienced, you know, artist. And so she kind of came over and went, huh, I know how to do this stuff, you know. I don't. But Ian was like all ears and eyes and yeah, yeah, show me, Chuck. This is so cool, you know. So um, that's when I thought, you know, I guess I kind of know what I'm doing now because I'm showing <laughs> a new guy how to do it, you know. That's really yeah. cool. And since since we're talking about Ian, let's talk about Ian for a little bit and we'll get yeah, back sure. to to, yeah. to Chuck and King of the Hill, man. So when uh ladies and gentlemen, if you've uh listened to any of these episodes with King of the Hill, man, Ian's been a huge focal point because if there's anything I love doing when somebody is sadly no longer here is remembering them through these stories um and memories of folks like Chuck here. So when you hear that name, man, Ian. What's the first, obviously you told us that story, but is there a first thought or a first memory or a first encounter, you know, uh, with Ian? Um, well, this is not too long. I remember James McDermott, actually, the guy I started with the same day, uh, telling me the story. It was Christmas time. I think it was probably Christmas time of 97. And we had a, always had a Christmas tree in the, in the, our tiny little lobby, you know, mm -hmm. on our floor. I think it was the second floor we were on. Maybe it was at the third floor. I can't remember. Um, and <laughs> James, James goes, I got to tell you this, Chuck. This is so funny. I go, what? And he goes, I saw Ian standing by the Christmas tree and and nobody was around. He didn't know I saw him, you know. And he kind of looked around to see if anybody was looking. And he got up on his tiptoes. And James demonstrated how he leaned forward. Ian was a tall, thin, very fit guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, he leaned forward on his tiptoes and went and sniffed the tree. <laughs> like he just wanted to smell that Christmas tree. Yeah. And I can't think of anything that's more quintessential Ian Wilcox than him finding joy and sniffing a Christmas tree, you know. Um, so that was the first, my first thought. And then there are a couple other things that come to mind. Um, I don't know if anybody told you that he was a writer. I don't uh, think so. He loved to write. Yeah, he um, he wrote an entire King of the Hill script and um, passed it around. Everybody read it. It was fantastic. I'll tell you. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it could have totally been a great King of the Hill episode. I can't remember what it was about or anything, but he uh, he showed it to, to Greg Daniels. 
And uh, he thought, hey, maybe they'll do it, you know? And, you know, good for him. And Greg uh, read it and said, you know, this is really good. Um, but he kindly, politely told him, you know, we have to use writers that are part of the Writers Guild and we can't just take any script from the outside, you know? And he goes, but I'm happy to try to turn you on to agents. And so I know Ian pursued writer. I don't know exactly what he did after that, but I thought, man, he's a, he's a talented writer. So that's the other thing about Ian is, is um, he was so um, openly innocent and almost naive, mm -hmm. but the guy was sharp as a tack. And yeah. he was very, very deep, very intelligent. I've never met anybody like that. Um, the other story about him is um, um, in the year 2000, um, I was working in the background painting department. He was still background layout. Um, my wife of 15 years had left me one day. She just, you know, we didn't have any kids or anything. She just decided she didn't want to be married to me anymore. Totally yeah. broke my heart. It was just m one of the worst experiences ever. And I was just dying, you know, and I would just, but somehow drag myself into work every day. Thank God for that job. I think it kept me sane. Um, and then Ian very kindly came in when he knew I was suffering and, and he, and he was just very, his, just his presence, you know, he didn't say much, but he, you know, what do you say to somebody that was going through what I was going through? But he goes, he goes, you know, Chuck, um, I find, I don't know if this means anything to you or it makes sense, but he goes, I find that the times in life when I'm hurting the most most is when I feel most alive mm. and I was like whoa you know my first yeah. thought was I don't know what the hell you're talking about I didn't say that but I said well thank you and I and I thought about that for days after that like, like what does he mean you know and uh after some time went by and I got through that terrible period in my life and I ended up meeting the love of my life a few months later or maybe a year and a half later who I'm married to now, Paulette. Um, I know what he's talking about. Because I, I did, I was in touch with everything. I was so acutely aware of everything because of, of mm. all the pain I was going through. You know, so so that was Ian, you know. And uh, just just a lovely guy. Just a lovely guy. I was so, so proud to have known him. Yeah, I, I've really enjoyed all the stories you guys have shared because not knowing the guy it feels like i know a little bit about somebody that was such a huge part in not only creating my favorite show my favorite adult show of all time but uh just knowing that he had a hand in helping folks like you and glenn and paul and all of these other guys that i've had on so far uh, i i love this i love the stories i think my my favorite one so far was when they took his uh, Patriots flag and then took pictures of it and sent it all over. I just thought that was so cool and just him getting a big kick out of it. It just I, I could just story. see him. I could just see him there with the big <laughs> shit eating grin, you know, just happy, you know. Um, but yeah, man. So thank you for sharing those stories. Um, yeah, sure. You know, so as we as we talked about, uh, you know, your your first days meeting Ian and then you know what it was like working on King of the Hill. Um, you gave me three episodes that, that stuck out to you, and all of these are really, really fun, man. Husky Bobby, Texas City Twister, and they call it Bobby Love. Which one do you want to start with first? Oh, well, I guess we'll start off with Texas City Twister because that's the first show. That's the first show where my work appeared on TV mm -hmm. in a small way because I, I wasn't assigned to that show, but I was helping it out because it was a big episode. And... Um, I remember, um, kind of forgetting his name, one of the background layout guys, um, forgetting his name, but um, I said, you need some help, you know? And um, um, he goes, he goes, yeah, here, draw this cornfield, you know? And it was, it was, I think it was an aerial shot. I think it was an aerial shot of the cornfield when they were driving through the road in the cornfield and the, and the wind was blowing and he goes, so draw, draw a bunch of corn stalks and then animate it. <laughs> and I was like, dude, I have no idea how to animate corn. You know what I mean? I just barely started working here. And he goes, okay, well, just 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 draw the corn and then and, uh, and then I'll I'll do the animation. And I, I realized later all he meant was just draw the corn stalks um, with the wind blowing this way, and then draw, draw another position going that way. That's really all you see. Yeah. Um, and then uh, they gave me the uh, the Megalomart when uh, Hank and 
Bobby pull in there and he needs a fuel filter, I think it was. So I drew the, the front of the Megalomart and then I do the interior of it when they went in there with all the uh, the cash register, you know, booths and everything. Um, and I was like, wow, this is cool, you know. And this is right after I started working there because I was still waiting for my scenes on Husky Bobby, which was the first show I was assigned to. So, um, yeah, when I saw the animatic with my background in there, I was like, whoa, there it is. I'm doing it, you know. And then when I saw it on TV, it was the first thing that aired that I had done. I was just over the moon. Uh, and then so, yeah, so Husky, Husky Bobby was, uh, Martin Archer was directing that. And uh, <laughs> it was quite an experience. Um, I was just like all, you know, I was just open to, you know, what do I do, you know? And so I was sitting in my my little cubicle and uh, waiting for scenes, you know, to, to work on. And, and um, the storyboard was still being worked on. They were just... That's the thing about King of the Hill. We're always behind schedule. <laughs> like American Dad that I work on now is a super finely tuned machine. But this thing, we're always like behind. Um, so then finally one day Martin comes in. Martin was like a biker dude, really thin, long hair, total hippie. Really cool guy. I love both him and Wes. Just the best guys. Um, mm. Very different, but kind of the same. And then, so, you know, I had, they had kind of a Texas... Uh, twang to their accents martin comes in sits down cross-legged like a hippie you know on the floor of my cubicle with all these storyboard pages like he, kind of shuffling through them like he didn't know what to give me to work on or something and uh, i just remember thinking so this is working on king of the hill this is what it's like looking at my director sitting on the floor with long hair just going, oh, I don't know, man, you know? <laughs> and uh, so he had, well, the, I think the first thing I worked on, I remember the very first background I did was, I think it was, was at the beginning of the show when it shows you're looking out the window and it shows some shoes on a little pedestal and you see Peggy and Hank looking in the store window with the parking yeah. lot behind them. That was my very first background. Yeah. And I just remember drawing it going, I'm drawing my first background, you know, <laughs> for the show. Whoa, you know, I can do this, you know, I can, I can draw shoes, you know. <laughs>